Good afternoon. I'm George Latimer, Westchester County Executive. This is Tuesday, November 23rd. We want to welcome you to our weekly update of Westchester issues, and we appreciate uh, you watching to get an update on the COVID issues and a few other things we want to report on. This, of course, is uh, Thanksgiving week. We're two days in advance of Thanksgiving, and so we want to wish uh, from everybody here in our county family to you and your family a very happy and a very healthy Thanksgiving. We hope that you're able to be with the ones that you love to celebrate this secular holiday where we all give thanks for the many blessings we've been given. We also uh, ask you to use your good judgment in uh, those family interactions. We're still dealing in the pandemic world of COVID and uh, with Thanksgiving and the holidays that are gonna follow, we wanna make sure that we don't spread the disease. So please use every precaution that you know is necessary in order to make sure that uh, your Thanksgiving dinner doesn't become a source of some a greater problem down the line. It should be a joyous moment, and we hope it will be that for you. And we also want to extend to our Jewish brothers and sisters who, starting over the, the end of the weekend and into next week, will be celebrating the Festival of Lights Hanukkah, uh, a very joyous Hanukkah season. And it comes a little bit earlier this year than it traditionally does, but we extend again to our Jewish brothers and sisters that great, uh, that great holiday feast. I'm joined, as I am always, by our Deputy County Executive, Ken Jenkins, who's with us here today. And uh, as we do our report today, we will invite Bridget Gibbons, our Director of Economic Development, to join us also to give a report on one of the many issues that we want to cover with you today. Uh, our COVID information is where we always begin. Uh, the, the data that we have that dates back to Sunday shows now uh, the last two and a half weeks a continued rise in the number of COVID cases. Uh, we had 1,792 active cases as of Sunday. That number has probably gone up a little bit yesterday and today. It has been a steady rise over the last few weeks, and I think we attribute that to the colder weather. More of our activities are going indoors, uh, and we have sort of the two-week uh, period after Halloween and now as we approach Thanksgiving. We saw this happen last year. The colder the weather, the more we are in social contact with each other, the more those numbers go up. The total number of infections and even the percentage of infections out of all the different tests is really not the most important number that we track. To give you just one day's indicator, on Sunday there were 7,707 tests for COVID 156 of them came back positive. As a percentage, that's a relatively low percentage. It means that 7,500 cases were positive of the tests and 150 were, um, pardon, were negative and 150 were positive examples of COVID. That's a very large number of people that tested negative for COVID out of the full cohort. But when we're counting active cases, which is how many people over the last two weeks have, uh, have come down with COVID and have not yet uh, defeated it through their normal uh, body systems, their, their antibody systems, uh, 156 cases in a day is uh, a lot larger number of cases than we had, say, a month ago or two months ago. And this roller coaster ride that we're on is now on another one of these upswings. When we had the Delta variant strike us at the end of June into July, we, uh, we had a rise in cases that maxed out at 2,800 active cases in August. That compares to a peak of 11,500 cases last January after the holiday season pre-vaccinations. And the very beginning of the COVID uh, um, uptick back uh, almost two years ago now in, in uh, March and April of 2020, that maximum number was 12,000 active cases. So 12,000, 11,500 now with vaccinations across the board, approaching 92% of all Westchester adults. Uh, the max number for the Delta variant was 2,800. And as of Sunday, we were 1,800. So we are, we are rising, but it is not as steep a rise as you might see. Uh, our hospitalization numbers, the last hospitalization number we have dates back to Saturday, when we had 41 people hospitalized for COVID. And our fatalities were static for a full week, 2,354 uh, individuals who have lost their life in the aggregate. And we have gone now uh, over a week without any additional fatalities. That is a good number. We hope that number will continue. When we compare month over month, we lost in the prior month 16 individuals to COVID. The prior month, we lost 13. So 13 to 16 is a fairly small, statistically not a significant uh, percentage of increase. So, so our uh, hospitalizations and our fatalities have been relatively flat, even as the number of infections has risen over the last month. I always mention every time a word of fatality comes into the conversation, every fatality is an important fatality. It's a person 
a human being, a family with that individual, people who knew them, who loved them, who care about them. So we do not treat fatalities as statistics, but we do look at numbers to try to judge trends. And what we think we're seeing now is a, an increase in the number of infections because we are in closer quarters with each other, but at the same time, the severity of the infections are not increasing proportionally to the number of infections. And that's a very important situation. We're gonna be dealing with exactly what it is that could tax our health system uh, to the greatest degree. And that is happening right now in other parts of New York State, western part of the state, particularly the Buffalo area and the uh, Finger Lakes area, that area, the western part of the state. We have 2,700 hospital bedrooms in the 11 ho uh, hospitals in Westchester County. And we also treat, in addition to that, hospitals like Danbury and Greenwich, Connecticut, nearby hospitals as, as locations that Westchester residents will go to to be hospitalized. 2,700 total rooms, 41 people hospitalized for COVID. We are nowhere near maxing out the, the medical capacity of our system. That may not be the case in other parts of the state and certainly not in other parts of the country. So when we look to see how severe we, it's not just how many people are being infected, what's the percentage of infection on any day, but how many of them are severely affected by the infection. And that is found in the number of hospitalizations and the number of fatalities. So those two numbers staying relatively flat is some good news, even as we look at the rise in the number of cases. And our actions have been uh, traditionally proportionate to where the infections and where the fatalities and where the hospitalizations uh, list. We are not taking an action either for or against uh, opening or closing anything for the sake of the action itself. We're taking action that's proportionate to the level of uh, pandemic that we see. If the pandemic indicators rise, particularly hospitalizations, as we start to see a rise that starts to approach the total capacity of our hospital system to act, we will take action and we will take more severe action. But we don't do that action out of ideology and we don't refrain from doing it out of ideology. And that's a very difficult message to share sometimes because people have pretty fixed ideas about what they'd like to see. They'd like to see this particular action taken all the way up and down across the board regardless of the numbers. And other people have a philosophy that says take none of these actions no matter what it is because this is not as serious as people think it is and uh, it's being overblown. We don't subscribe to either philosophy. We subscribe to a pragmatism. What is the problem that faces us and what is the best way to deal with what faces us? And we adjust our strategies based on the numbers. So when we go through these numbers, and I've been tracking them every day now for the length of this pandemic, we look at it, we discuss it, we talk about it from a practical terms. We believe that our strategy to try to advance the amount of vaccinations, we are at almost 92% of our adult population vaccinated. We've been given the authority now to administer a third booster shot to all individuals who have been given the first two shots, or the first Johnson & Johnson shot. That is now authorized, and we've now been authorized for a couple of weeks for pediatric vaccinations for those under the age of 12. And as we go about making those vaccinations readily available, we're doing that in a way to, to uh, connect the fact that we clearly saw a correlation between the number of people vaccinated and a reduction in the number of infections. It is a debatable point for some people on the internet, but it is not debatable in the actual facts as we are tracking it. We have had less infections under COVID because of vaccinations. Some people with underlying health issues have been affected negatively even though vaccinated, and, and uh, some individuals have suffered fatality having been vaccinated, but it's a very small percentage number. The vast majority of the people, we believe, are the unvaccinated individuals in the society. Now, we at the county government have made no specific mandate to require the vaccination, and we understand that when you reach 92% almost, of vaccinated individuals. The portion that is unvaccinated are people who are very committed to not being vaccinated. This is not a philosophical debate. This is not we need to give you more information. We have had great success in vaccinating our workforce. We've had department after department every week. We've shared that with you uh, in our Just the Facts, We're Vaxxed campaign. And we've seen plenty of parts of county government. We do not have 100% of all of the employees vaccinated. Uh, however, we've seen such an increase in vaccinations that we felt that the measures that we were using were effective. And to put the vaccination in as many areas to make it as easy as, and accessible as possible would help. And we're taking the same attitude with pediatric vaccinations. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in specific. But the numbers that we're looking at show that we are at a time of the year where we do expect now to see an increase in infections. And we want to track to see if the increase in infections represents an increase in severity, hospitalization, fatality, 
and also that our vaccination numbers now start to broaden, where individuals who've received uh, the, the initial series, vaccination series now, come back for the booster shot, which in theory should make them more resistant to new infections. That may offset uh, the trend line that we're having in terms of the, the weather and the season, and, and we'll, we'll track that down to be sure. Once again, 91.8% of all Westchester adults, 18 and over, have received at least one vaccination dose, and they're awaiting their second dose. 92% uh, is, is just about where we are at, and that is a tremendous number, just 8% short of 100% vaccination. We lead the other counties around us in vaccination percentage. Some of them are starting to catch up to us, and I would be more than happy to be at, at the same level of vaccination as everybody else around us in the mid to upper 90s if we could get to that level. We're not trying to win any race. We want to see as many people as resistant to the disease as possible. And with that resistance to the disease, then the, the, the uh, threat of the disease starts to lessen. And the whole purpose is to try to get back to normalcy. Whatever normalcy is, we may have forgotten what normalcy looks like, but we're going to try our best to get there. Um, in terms of pediatric vaccinations, there is a link where you can register for a COVID vaccination. And we have a clinic here, White Plains Health Clinic, right here in downtown White Plains, 134 Court Street in White Plains. We're opening up on Saturday, November 27th. That's this weekend, Thanksgiving weekend, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. for children to be vaccinated between the ages of 5 and 11. You go on our health department homepage, westchestergov.com. Look for health, that's the, the uh, qualifier, and you will be able to sign up. Registration is required. This is not a walk-in setting, but this is for um, uh, vaccination for children. There have been uh, vaccination uh, locations for children. We, a couple of weeks ago, we had, uh, the, I think the first time that we showed it was at uh, the Mount Vernon Neighborhood Health Center. They received an allocation of 600 units. We have been uh, providing uh, on a test basis here in White Plains, uh, pediatric vaccinations. And then we've had in some of the school areas around. I happened to attend one of them in my home community of Rye City last Friday to see how many kids were being vaccinated there. I think they reached about 350 children. But we're looking all over the county. We're looking at Peekskill. We're looking at Pelham. We're looking at Pound Ridge and Pleasantville and communities that don't begin with the letter P. <laughs> so that we show that there's a complete uh, effort to try to make vaccinations available to everyone. And now that it's been authorized, at the federal government level, at the CDC level, we will try to make those uh, those vaccinations available across the board. Uh, we want to mention that uh, there was some action taken in Washington, D.C. regarding uh, the um, tax deduction for state and local tax, uh, known as SALT, that's the acronym, State and Local Taxation. Traditionally, over the last 100 years, I think since the income tax was instituted in uh, 100 years ago, 1917 or 16, whatever came into play, there was a deduction made uh, from your federal tax liability for whatever money you paid to state and local taxes, and that both property and income taxes. And that made logical sense because if you received a salary of $50,000 to use an arbitrary figure, if you paid out of your income $2,000, $3,000 to your state government or to your local government, you didn't have the benefit of that money. So when the federal government comes in to tax your income, they subtract out the money that you legally had to pay to your state and to your local and tax you on that portion of your income which you received separate and distinct from the local taxes you paid. You had that as an exemption. It's on your itemized deduction form for those of you who are familiar with uh, those taxes. That changed a couple of years ago. The federal government under the prior uh, federal administration and the prior control of the Senate and the House eliminated the state and local taxation deduction. That was a $1 trillion financial impact, and it helped to offset the plan that was passed that reduced taxes for corporations and for high-wealth individuals. When that tax break came for corporations and high-wealth individuals, the cost of that was $2.X trillion to the federal budget, and they offset it by getting rid of the SALT deduction. Why would they do that? Because in many parts of the country, state and local governments do not tax property or income to the same level that they do in some other states. And it also correlates to the level of services that are provided. Just to give you two examples, in the New York metropolitan area, 
We have mass transit. We have the Metropolitan Transit Authority, Long Island Railroad, Metro North Railroad, New York City bus and subway system. Uh, the NASA uh, bus system is under that aegis. We pay a portion of t our taxation bill to support that mass transit system that involves uh, getting people in and out of New York City for work. It unclogs our roads. It clears our environment by having mass transit. There is no equivalent mass transit in the state of Florida. There's no equivalent mass transit in the state of Texas. Those states do not, therefore, tax their local people to run a system of subways when they don't have the subways to do it, or they don't have commuter rail to do it. We do in New York. They do it in the Boston area with the Metropolitan uh, Transit Authority equivalent in Boston with the, uh, with the T-Line. They have it in Chicago, and they have it in Philadelphia, SEPTA, Southeast Pennsylvania Transit Authority. Those states, aka blue states, provide a mass transit service for which local and state taxes pay for it. When you live in a state that doesn't have those services, you therefore don't pay the same level of taxation in those states. And the same would be true in services such as Medicaid coverage. Medicaid coverage in New York covers certain services that are not covered in South Carolina. Why? Because in the, the decision makers of the state of New York believe that those who are indigent should have coverage for certain dental services. In South Carolina, they chose not to do that. So they have lower taxes in South Carolina, but lower services to uh, uh, to be commensurate. You may live in any state of the nation that you choose to live in. And I myself have lived in three other states besides New York when my corporate career required me to move. But the different level of taxations in these states do not take into account that the federal government is still taxing the individual based on what is their discretionary income. The individual does not have the discretion not to pay local and state taxes. Therefore, they don't have the resources, and therefore, the tax deduction was put into place. When that was eliminated, actually, they created a, a cap of $10,000, which is oftentimes well below the amount that you pay in those local taxes. The individual wound up paying more federal taxes based on that, on that decision. Now, the, uh, the national government uh, has passed uh, legislation that would change that cap of $10,000 for the SALT deduction up to $80,000. And that now opens it up for many people to be able to properly claim their state and local tax deductions uh, in a way that they could not under the prior uh, circumstances. We in New York, and myself as an individual elected official, Ken, and many of our colleagues, and in some cases across both sides of the aisle in New York State, we have supported the restoration of that uh, deduction. And now, while it's not fully restored, it's significantly restored, which means when you file your taxes next year, we believe you will have on that itemized deduction form a greater tax deductibility for your state and local taxes. Keep in mind that we have imposed in New York State now over a decade a tax cap for local property taxes of 2%. None of the jurisdictions can go over 2%. And in fact, here in Westchester County, we have actually cut your local county property taxes two years in a row, and the budget that is before the Board of Legislators right now would cut your county taxes for the third year in a row. So it's not a cap of 2%. It's below zero. It's a reduction. But nonetheless, there have been efforts made to try to reduce uh, the, those obligations and now met by a change in federal policy to restore the state and local tax deduction we think is good for the men and women of Westchester County as well as elsewhere. Many people who live in these areas might have an income level that is very high for someone who might live in another area of the country. And they would look at that and they'd say, wow, you're making a lot of money. Uh, you know, you're doing very well for yourself. Well, given the cost of living in an area, there are parts of this state, much less parts of this nation, where the house that uh, exists in Westchester County is a lot less expensive in one of those places, meaning you pay less in mortgage when you have a lower cost house that you have to buy. And if in those areas the cost of other services are less, you pay less money and you look at the total amount of, um, of uh, revenue that you receive for your compensation as, as being a good number, but not necessarily having a higher level of lifestyle from different individuals. We want to thank our Congress members, uh, Sean Patrick Maloney, uh, Mondeo Jones, Jamal Bowman, for their efforts in continuing to do this, and of course, our great United States Senators, Kirsten Gillibrand and Senator and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer for being advocates for these changes. This is an important tax break for Westchester County residents uh, who, ha who have had to uh, pay tax on their tax, which is what happens when there was no SALT deduction. You were paying a tax on your taxation, and that we think is unfair. 
Um, another one of our initiatives that we want to highlight is an effort being made uh, by our, uh, our team in the economic development uh, portion of our county government to deal with career training programs. And in this case, in one of the targeted fields that we're trying to incentivize business in, and that's advanced manufacturing. Westchester County for many years prided itself on its economic development. When I was a young man in Westchester, child um, economic development growth in Westchester was bringing major U.S. corporations to move their headquarters to the county. And while we welcome that at any point in time, that's much less of what's happening in business these days. What is happening is that businesses that exist here are either growing or expanding, and it's in the effort to expand that we see certain very specialized kinds of areas. Financial technology is one, advanced manufacturing is another, that builds off of the, uh, the highly educated workforce that lives in Westchester County and the ability for us to do programs such as the one that Bridget's going to explain in helping uh, identify and recruit career training opportunities. So with that, I'm going to ask Bridget Gibbons to join us and tell us about our advanced manufacturing initiative. Bridget. Thank you, County Executive. Uh, back in the start of 2021, we embarked on an economic development strategy that focused on four key sectors, biosciences, financial technology, clean energy, and advanced manufacturing. For advanced manufacturing, we established a task force consisting of 10 employers and other key stakeholders around the county um, to really identify uh, what was hindering these companies from growing. Um, at the very first task force meeting, it was loud and clear that these businesses were unable to hire entry-level uh, employees and were experienced employees. Um, so I quickly did some research and identified a gap in the county. Um, we really lacked a training program for our entry-level folks to get them prepared for a career in advanced manufacturing. Um, to address this, I, I partnered with Westchester Community College to uh, develop and implement a career training program that will allow individuals with little or no experience to earn a certificate that will put them on a path for a highly skilled, well-paying, and in-demand career. So today we're happy to announce the program is launching. A few key things to note, uh, participating in this program does not requ require a college degree or any prior experience. Uh, the six-month program is mostly virtual and is self-paced, so people can complete the program on their own time, whatever works best for them, nights, weekends, mornings, uh, whatever, whatever suits their schedule. They can keep their jobs and continue in this program. Um, each student will be assigned a mentor or a coach uh, to make sure that they don't encounter any hurdles to their successfully completing the program. Because it's mostly virtual, we know people can feel a little disconnected, so we want to make sure that they feel engaged and supported throughout this program. And we will loan laptops to people who are in need uh, to help them get through this uh, program um, because it is virtual, so they're going to need uh, some technology and there's no cost to the, um, the participants. Traditional manufacturing involves the, man the m making products on a large scale using machinery and human labor. Advanced manufacturing is quite different. Participants in this program will learn skills to create products using computers, robotics, 3D printing, and more, as well as master the basics of safety, quality, manufacturing processing, processes, and green production. Uh, the program will off also offer opportunities to see firsthand what it's like to work in this uh, field. We're going to be connecting the uh, students with employers in advanced manufacturing who are hiring now so they can see what it's like to work at these very cool uh, companies. Upon completion, participants will hold a certified production technician 4.0 certificate, um, and that's a great credential to have. Um, the training program will launch in January of 2022, and people who are interested can go to westchestercatalyst.com slash sign me up. And by <laughs> putting your name, uh, your email address uh, at that page, we'll, we will notify you when you, uh, the enrollment period is open. Um, I want to thank the county executive for his support on this important initiative. I want to also thank Westchester Community College for their partnership in making this program a reality. And last, I want to thank Harold King and Johnny Ann Hansen of the Council of Industry, who provided a lot of guidance to make sure that we shape the program appropriately. Anyone who has questions or needs further information, feel free to contact my office at 914-995-2900. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's Bridget Gibbons, who's our Director of uh, Economic Development. We appreciate her leadership 
and her team's uh, involvement and also their creativity in looking at different ways that we deal with uh, the opportunities of economic development um, in an environment that is very dynamic. Things are changing. We're trying to pull out of COVID. So I think this is an interesting initiative. And also, I think it also makes uh, good use of our Westchester Community College. The, uh, the traditional two-year community college experience is very changed in this day and age. It is a place for re-educating and retraining, and this is a good way to, to magnify that. So, Bridget, thank you again for your leadership on all of this, and please extend our thanks to the other members of your team who are involved with that. Speaking of kids signing up, many of the young folks will be home for uh, the holidays, uh, for Thanksgiving, uh, back home to get a, a good meal with the family and possibly to connect with their friends from high school, as I recall those days a long time ago. But uh, there are some other issues that are involved that would be helpful to us. So I'm going to ask Ken Jenkins to uh, talk a little bit about uh, what can be happening over the course of the next few days. Ken. Thanks, George. Um, some of them will also do a little bit of laundry as well. Um, so. <laughs> Kids home for the holidays, um, it's never, never too early to start planning for your summer. And Westchester County Parks, Recreation, and Conservation is already seeking lifeguards for the 2022 seasons. And if you remember what happened during 2021, it was a, a challenging year to get those lifeguards in place. Um, and the county, uh, under County Executive George Latimer's leadership, we were able to in decrease the age of individuals that were participating in the program, making sure that they got all of the things that they needed, the training that they would have to have in order to be lifeguards. And they were an, an exciting group. Um, both the county executive, George and I both went to um, the, their own internal um, competitions, which were held at the end of the season. Those applications are available right now. If you go to westchestergov.com um, to um, job-opportunities slash lifeguards wanted. So you have to be between the age of 15 or older to apply. This gives a great opportunity for our teens and young adults um, to do one of the you know, life's greatest responsibilities and a skill that will be essential for their entire life. That's that life saving techniques. The skills along with working along with their peers, they become lifelong friends and they actually come back as, as George just pointed out, when they come home from school, they get together and they, they talk and they wanna make sure they get together and continue to work on all of those um, fine, outstanding skills that they have. The applicants must have at least a, cert a current American Red Cross lifeguarding or first aid or a CPR and of uh, advanced um, lifeguard certifications. If you don't have that, don't be afraid to apply and ask the questions because as I pointed out earlier, the county did help provide those courses to individuals working with various entities around, uh, around the county to be able to provide those um, valuable and essential trainings in this um, regard. County Parks offers the opportunities for the new guards, which is either waterfront training or an option to guard at either a pool or a beach. So the various locations, you gotta be able to get to those locations. Some of them are not in walking distance to anything. So whether that's the Saxonwood Pool in White Plains, which is on a bus line, the Springbridge Pool in Yonkers, Tibbetts Brook Pool in Yonkers, Wilson Waves in Mount Vernon, as well as the Croton Point Park Beach, or Glen Island Beach in New Rochelle. Those are all very, very great opportunities for our young people that are coming home. Um, and again, it's not, it's not too bad to let our children know that these opportunities exist, but more importantly, it's great for those life-saving techniques. Thanks again. Thanks, Kevin. All right, George. Now also over the course of uh, the next couple of days, Ken Jenkins will be launching on Friday our Winter Wonderland uh, program and it's actually uh, sponsored by the Westchester Parks Foundation with the cooperation of the County Parks Recreation Department at Kensico Dam Plaza. Uh, after the Friday kickoff, we will continue on until Sunday, January 2nd. So there's a long period of time in which you can enjoy this. As with last year, Winter Wonderland has been turned into a drive-through event. So you can pile the kids in the car. It's actually a little less expensive than paying for kids individually. You can pull some neighbor's kids into the car if you've got space okay. and drive them through, which is over a mile long driving route with lights and activity that would really be terrific. We had more people enjoy the lights last year with the drive-in component than uh, in the prior years. It's a drive-in uh, program. Again, we did a launch kickoff 
not too long ago, Santa made an early visit to Westchester County, and uh, he will be there as part of Winter Wonderland at Kensico Dam Plaza. Again, the lights are going to be flipped on on that Friday after uh, Thanksgiving. Ken will be there to do the honors again this year. And uh, we encourage you to uh, go online, westchestergov.com. You'll find the information through our recreation department. Winter Wonderland at Kensico Dam Plaza. Great place to take the kids for a lot of fun. Uh, and another great place to take them for a lot of fun is at our Lasden Park and Arboretum. That's located on Route 35, Katona, Somers, uh, along the northern tier of the county. It's uh, between I-684 on the east and Taconic Parkway on the west. And Lasden, an estate that was uh, donated to Westchester County, uh, has become a central location for a number of our different activities. And there's an Arboretum there which is a, a glass-enclosed structure that has plants of various sizes. It is a smaller version of what you will see in the Bronx, in the Bronx Botanical Garden uh, in the conservatory down there. Uh, and this is going to be a, a wonderful place for another reason. There's an annual train show uh, that will be on display. It opens uh, this Saturday over the weekend. You can go to lasdenpark.org and get the information. It's been expanded to more than 5,000 square feet of indoor and outdoor exhibit space. As a little kid, I was a big fan of model railroading and I had a chance to see the exhibit uh, as it was being constructed in the last month. It's a lot of fun, and if you have kids that you think would enjoy it, we encourage you to, uh, to do that. And there's also visits with Santa tied into that experience. Tickets are sold online only. There's no walk-up buying of, uh, of tickets and uh, scheduled viewing times. No tickets sold on site. Again, these are COVID provisions to try to avoid long lines and, and interaction with people that could lead to perhaps expanding the uh, infection. So you must go online. Lasdenpark.org is the place to go. You can call 864-7268 for more information. Again, we want to thank uh, the Parks Foundation, and um, uh, particularly the role in this particular exhibit of the Westchester County Parks, the Friends of Lasden Park, and uh, also uh, Save a Tree in Bedford Hills and uh, Prospero Nursery and Masonry in White Plains. They are sponsors of this program. Admission is $20 per adult, $10 per child. It's free for those ages two and under, $15 for senior citizens, 62 and over. So I'm happy to say that to my fellow seniors. Um, that uh, you can get a slight discount by doing this. So both Winter Wonderland and Lasden Park are wonderful opportunities for you to enjoy with this Thanksgiving season. Uh, let me also mention, I, I mentioned very generally, that as we go into the Thanksgiving season, uh, there is a, a series of things to be concerned about. Make sure that you are protecting yourself at home. Uh, our Commissioner of Public Health, Dr. Shalita Amler, has laid out some of the different uh, issues and concerns. We try to provide some of this information online at westchestergov.com, uh, health uh, backslash. Um, she wants to make sure that since everybody from the age of five and older eligible for COVID-19 vaccinations, you should consider if vaccinations are appropriate before the family gets together. There's, there's only a little bit of time left to do that. Vaccines, in addition to the places that are made available through the county, which are on our website. Uh, they're available through local pharmacies, medical practices, as well as those through the health department. You can go online, you can make an appointment today being Tuesday, there's still time to start the vaccination process at the very least. If anybody in your family is really under the weather, they should avoid being in close uh, quarters with other individuals. We don't know that they will or won't have COVID, but you're taking a risk that really should be avoided. So you'll have to know individually. It might be something you've voted to all year, but if you're not in good health conditions, if you have what just appears to be a cold, err on the side of caution because those vulnerable in your family, whether they have an underlying health issue or they're seniors or young kids, they're vulnerable and we don't want uh, any tragedy to come out of what is otherwise a great family activity. There's also some practical mindedness that goes into uh, preparing a Thanksgiving meal. Don't take it from me. I can't cook my way out of a frying pan. But those who know how to prepare a proper Thanksgiving turkey know that you ought to check uh, with uh, uh, online information. The USDA Meat and Poultry Hotline is available, 888-674-6854 just to make sure you're preparing uh, both the, uh, the turkey and the trimmings in an appropriate way, make sure there's no uh, health issues that are involved in that. Most people don't need to be told that, but we tell you just to be sure that you know uh, and uh, that you have a safe and a healthy and a happy Thanksgiving. Uh, with those things, we will give our next report uh, on Monday, November 29th. That will be at two o'clock, the normal time, and we'll go back to it. We'll give you an update on COVID at that point in time. We'll look ahead 
to other activities that are coming. I'm sure we're going to have a cohort of uh, upcoming satellite vaccination locations. You do know that we are no longer providing vaccination, vaccinations through the state at the Westchester County Center, but the state is continuing its partnership with the Westchester Medical Center at the medical center site in Valhalla on the Grasslands campus, and you may touch through the state and, and their resources if you'd like to get a vaccination at the Westchester Medical Center, and as we mentioned before, through any number of other different locations. I'm going to check with Catherine Chaffee, our Director of Communications. There seems to be no other press questions, so uh, anyone who is following this through the press, if you'd like to reach out to us, call Catherine at 995-2932. We'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have over any of the topics that we've mentioned as we go forward. And I will close by saying that the Westchester County Board of Legislators is currently under review of the 2022 county budget, which has been submitted to them by our uh, administration. Uh, they received the full operating budget and the special district budgets two weeks ago. They've had the capital budget for over a month and a half. Uh, as they go through their deliberations, they're having daily meetings, uh, department by department to review every asset of the budget. Um, they will be having a online public hearing coming up in early December. Uh, if you're interested, go to the Westchester Legislators website. You can also access it through the westchestergov.com website. You'll find the links and the information there if you want to testify at the public hearing. Uh, the uh, committee meetings that are happening every day are open to the public. You're welcome to call the office of the chairman, Ben Boykin, at 995-2800 and get any information as they do the review of the budget. Uh, they will be on Monday, December 6th, finalizing any additions to the budget, any additional expenditures, any additional revenues. And then the week after that, Monday, December 13th, we believe that they're going to come to uh, a long session, long day session. Ken's been involved in it, so have I over the years of our time in government to uh, close out the budget. We, uh, we presume that we'll be able to work through any amendments that the board uh, would like to see happen. And if we can do that, there'll be no vetoes and we'll then sign the budget shortly thereafter. If there are some other issues, we'll get to them at that point and determine uh, how best to handle them. But uh, we have a calendar year fiscal year, meaning that with the 1st of January, we begin the new budget cycle. And so we want to have that budget in place, uh, preferably by the 20th of December, giving us enough time for uh, the executive branch to uh, structure and administer what's necessary. We start fresh on the first day of the new year. Uh, we'll give you some information about the inauguration uh, ceremony this year uh, for the administration. It'll probably be very low key in comparison to what we did four years ago. Uh, but we'll announce that information, then we'll be off to, uh, uh, to an opportunity to serve you over the days to come. With no other questions, we thank you very much for watching. Um, and uh, again, we'll be back with you on Monday at 2 o'clock next Monday. We wish you again very happy Thanksgiving, very happy start to the Hanukkah season. Ken Jenkins, George Latimer, those from the administration, we wish you all the very best. Stay safe, and we'll see you soon.